Acts chapter 2, a passage that is maybe one of the passages that stands out when you think about anticipating the book of Acts, the culmination of Peter's first sermon. Acts chapter 2, verse 37 through 41, that I'm going to begin reading in verse 36 because it gives the, the climactic declaration of his message, and then we're going to focus on the response, what happened as a result of Peter's sermon that we've studied over the last month or so. Acts chapter 2, verse 36, let's begin reading. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. What a moment! What a moment! Try to imagine in your minds, go back in time and imagine this moment. This unscholarly fisherman standing in front of a crowd. He preaches, quotes the Old Testament and declares the impossible that Jesus Christ, the crucified one, has risen from the dead and has proven himself to be God's Messiah. And unlike many crowds in the book of Acts who would resort to violence at this message, this crowd is cut to the heart. They're confronted with the reality that the Lord of all was crucified on a tree, and that connection cuts into their soul, and they are transformed. 3,000 people in a single day are saved. What a moment. What a... What a sight they must have seen in their souls as they gazed in their heart of hearts and saw again Jesus Christ now revealed to be the Lord of glory hanging and expiring on that tree. And it penetrated them and it crushed them to the point of repentance and faith. What a moment. It's a moment that a man named John Newton experienced just about 300 years ago now. You may have heard of John Newton. He's the composer of the famous hymn, Amazing Grace. He was born in 1725. And almost all of us know him for Amazing Grace and also for his work in supporting William Wilberforce, who abolished the slave trade in England. All the more incredible because Newton had been a captain of a slave trip, a slave ship rather, and he he eventually came to repent and see the diabolical nature of that trade, and he was transformed. The gospel changed him. He wrote another hymn. I'm going to read a bit of it this morning because I think it, it encaptures in poetic form what these people experienced as Peter preached. They saw something that only the Spirit of God could bring to them. It's something that I, I pray all of us, Christians and non-Christians alike this morning, would see again. Newton wrote this, In evil long I took delight, unawed by shame or fear, till a new object struck my sight and stopped 
my wild career. I saw one hanging on a tree in agonies and blood, who fixed his languid eyes on me as near his cross I stood. Sure, never till my latest breath can I forget that look. It seemed to charge me with his death, though not a word he spoke. My conscience felt and owned the guilt and plunged me in despair. I saw my sins his blood had spilt and helped to nail him there. Alas, I knew not what I did, but now my tears are vain. Where shall my trembling soul be hid? For I, the Lord, have slain. A second look he gave, which said, I freely all forgive. This blood is for your ransom paid. I die that you may live. Thus, while his death my sin displays in all its blackest hue, such is the mystery of grace. It seals my pardon, too. With pleasing grief and mournful joy, my spirit now is filled that I should such a life destroy, yet live by him I killed. My prayer this morning is that this passage would turn every one of us into a John Newton, that every one of us would experience a amazing look, that that conclusion to Peter's sermon, this Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, whom you crucified, would, would <laughs> press into our souls and that we would be like Newton and say, we, we've realized the truth. We would experience that combination of being cut to the heart and then lifted up to heaven and exaltation. I think that's what they experienced in that crowd. I want to do kind of two things this morning. I want to walk through the, the passage, and we'll do that in three stages, or kind of three stages uh, to this little paragraph. And then we'll, we'll lose, use the last section of the message just to apply this to ourselves. Let's walk through this passage in, in three parts. First, the conviction, the conviction, is what begins in verse 37, the conviction and then the call and then the conversion. So the conviction in verse 37, we, we read, now when they heard this, this about Jesus, who Jesus was, is revealed to them. He's the risen Lord and Messiah. And they're confronted with the fact that they were the ones that had called for his crucifixion. When they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Let's think about this conviction, because that's essentially what that means. They were cut to the heart. It means they were, they were pierced with a sense of guilt and responsibility and ownership. The shock and guilt of what Peter had just said and the truth of it penetrated them and left them helpless and desperate. So they say to Peter, what shall we do? The most shocking crime in humanity had just been laid at their door. Unbeknownst to them, they had crucified God the Son. And unlike countless other moments in the, mystery, in the ministry of Jesus, this time God allows them to see it. it it's, it's very important that we understand them being cut to the heart wasn't something that they did. They didn't choose to cut their own hearts. This was something that God did. And it's something that only God could do, because we see throughout the book of Acts, many crowds who hear the exact same message, the exact same presentation of Jesus, whose hearts are hardened by the message rather than softened. So they pick up stones to throw people who say the exact same kind of thing about Jesus. So this, this conviction that penetrates them is a result of, of God's grace opening their eyes to see the reality of what Peter is saying. In human potential, that you, you could easily hear this message and ignore it, despise it, mock it, call it blasphemy, but they see that it's true. 
The means of this is simply Peter telling them the truth about Jesus. There's no special effects. There was no drama. There was no video aid. Peter didn't have props. He just declared, Jesus Christ is Lord of all, and he was crucified, and you are responsible for it. And that and that alone allowed them to come to the reality of Jesus being who he was, and they were crushed with conviction. Notice also the depth of their conviction. Notice that they're, they're cut to the heart, it says. Oh, that was the phrase that affected me this week. I thought, Lord, I, I want to stay in touch with being cut to the heart by the responsibility that we have for Jesus' death. It may not just be a topic that we reference. May it not just be a, a truth that we slide into our bookshelf and that we confidently glance out now and then to give us assurance of salvation. Lord, let, let there be a cutting to the heart this morning and in my own heart. Their, their self-confidence is broken. They came to Jerusalem as God-fearing Jews from around the world. They thought of themselves as belonging to the God of Israel, and yet... Now they are cut to the heart. Now they are, they are shattered in their own self-assessment. And then notice the result. That they're not content with just feeling grief. They want to do something. That's always the case with true conviction. It always motivates you to do something. Uh, that's one of the lies, I think, of depression, that depression tells us. Depression sometimes masquerades as guilt. Depression is not guilt. Because depression says, I'm just going to remain in this place of feeling terrible. Guilt, real guilt, always leads us to action. It always leads us to do something. What, what can we do? And in this case, the only thing you can do is receive the assurance that Jesus Christ can give, Jesus Christ can give you. I remember having a friend one time who, who said he was going through this period of, of just hopelessness. Every time he woke up, he just felt hopeless all the time. And he went to a pastor who uh, knew him very well, so I wouldn't recommend this as your first point of counsel uh, when somebody's depressed. But this pastor knew him very well, and he said, I'm, I'm hopeless all the time. And this pastor said to him, I, I don't think you're hopeless enough. If you were really hopeless, you'd stop trying to look to yourself, and you'd cast it all on Jesus. And there's something true in that about when we experience real guilt, and these people experience real guilt. What, what can we do, brothers? I have to do something. I, I can't just stay in this place of, of grief and guilt and pretend like that's enough to feel bad about it. What can we do? So this conviction penetrates them, breaks their heart. They see Jesus like that hymn of Newton, and they say, I, I saw one hanging on a tree, and I realized who he was, and my, my heart was crushed and broken, and I had to do something about it. That leads to the call. Peter said to them in verse 38, Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, for the promise is for you. You know, it's easy to um, become familiar with passages like this as Christians, the truth of the gospel we hear about. Let's try to be freshly amazed at this this morning. Peter just said to the people who crucified Jesus that they're responsible for it. They say, what shall we do? And he says, turn from your sin and be baptized in Jesus' name. Have you thought about the surprise of that? Has that struck you recently? That the only thing they had to do was believe in the one that they had crucified? Isn't that a shocking thing? Is it shocking enough to your heart, to my heart this morning? I was, I was meditating on that. Just, am I, Lord, I want to be broken by this again, affected by this again. All they had to do was turn from their rejection of God and believe in Jesus. That's all they had to do. They, they didn't have to, to whip themselves every day for the rest of their life. They didn't have to climb upstairs on bare knees. They didn't have to go to some foreign nation and live in poverty for the rest of their life. They didn't have to go to purgatory and burn for years and years and years to make up for what they did. And they just had to repent and believe in the very one they had crucified. 
That's, that's the gospel we preach. The one we destroyed has become the means of our salvation. The one who died because of us is the only way we can be saved. My sin from this last week was what necessitated Jesus being on the cross. And the only solution for that blasphemy is to turn to him and say, will you receive this sin from me? And every time he says, yes. God. What good news that is. That's what he says. What a shocking turn of events, Peter says. What a shock. Isn't that a shocking turn of events? Brothers, we've just committed the worst sin imaginable. What can we possibly do? Wouldn't you expect it that Peter might have said, nothing. There's nothing you can do. Now, other people... Sure, they can believe in Jesus, but not you. There's nothing you can do. Yeah, sure, Jesus died for sinners, but not you. Not you. You crucified Jesus Christ. Do you have any idea the outrage of the angels when they watched you do that? Do you have any idea the kind of restraint that had to be exercised by God the Son when he watched you do that? Do you have any idea what it sounds like in heaven to hear people taking the name of Jesus as a curse? Do you have any idea? So, no. For you, nothing. I'm just letting you know. There's nothing you can do. The worst imaginable thing has been done by you, and there's nothing that can be done for you. I mean, imagine if, put yourself in the place of, of the father. Imagine if, if somebody ravaged your son the way these people ravaged his son. Imagine that. I mean, I, I would be out of my mind with fury. And all the politeness and gentle categories in the world could, couldn't stop me. I thought maybe I, I, I wouldn't <laughs> turn myself into a, a criminal, but I, I would be outraged. And I would say in response to this question, there is nothing you can do. Peter says, repent, which costs you nothing, and be baptized. And here's the shocking irony. In the name of Jesus Christ. The one you crucified is the one who invites you to take his name. And the news keeps going. For the promise is for you. It's for you. For you. It's for you. Worst sinner imaginable. It's for you. It's for you. And not just you. It's for your children. If they believe in Jesus, they can be saved. And it's not just for people right here. Anyone far off, they can be saved if they believe in Jesus. This is the call. What do we do, brothers? Believe in the name of Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. And your children can be saved if they believe in him. And anyone far off can be saved if they believe in him. This is the fountain filled with blood that we sing about in him. It's opened up for all of humanity. Anyone who is willing to receive that piercing of heart, seeing their sin, and to believe in Jesus Christ as the Messiah. Yes, believe in him. Repent and believe. And you can be saved, he says. And you will receive, what? The Holy Spirit of God himself. Remember, these are God-fearing Jews. They're in Jerusalem for the feast. And think about the surprise of this. Not only will you not be judged and destroyed, you will now have closer access to God than Moses had. What a reversal. Isn't this a reversal? Not only will you not be decimated and sent into the ground like those rebels in the wilderness or stoned like Achan was after he stole from God or judged like the Israelites in the desert. No, no, not only that is not going to happen. You, you now get to experience God's presence with you in a way that David never did and Moses could never lead the people to do. You, you now do get to receive the gift of what? God himself coming to dwell with you. The crucifiers now become those dwelt by God. 
That's the call. What do you do? Believe? What's the motivation to believe? You'll receive God himself. And there is no person, not the worst sinner, not the youngest child, not the person in the farthest reach of the earth that is excluded from this call. Nobody. There is nothing you've done in your life worse than what these people did in crucifying Jesus. And Peter says the promise is for you. Notice also the manner of Peter's call. It says he continued with many other words to exhort them. He bore witness and he said, save yourselves from this crooked generation. He has in mind this, this generation that has defied God and crucified the Son of God and that the ultimate judgment for those that will repent. Because that, that furious, terrible wrath of God that we could imagine would be the, the same wrath for anybody that had anything to do with Jesus' death. It, it, it is in place for those who refuse to believe in Jesus. So he's saying, look, this crooked generation is going to face a day when they will be confronted with the God they've rejected and they will experience his judgment. And so Peter appeals to them, look, save yourself. Come out of this terrible destruction that's just headed towards God's fury. Come out of it and, and come into the safety of Jesus Christ. Peter, in his, in his letter, uh, he, he talked about Noah. And I, I can only imagine Peter felt like Noah in this moment. I, I, I imagine he, he felt like Noah. Because he talks about that later in his, in his letter. He talks about how Noah, there was an example in Noah of the gospel. And I imagine he's standing there, maybe on this ledge or balcony or something. He's preaching to this crowd. And I imagine he just comes into his mind the imagery of, there's a flood of wrath coming, and I know the only ark. And so he, he appeals to them. And I think he imagines himself almost like a modern-day Noah. And he says, look, look, look. Here's the only ark that's going to be safe when God's wrath comes is named Jesus Christ. Get in. Get in. Do not stay with the people who crucify Jesus and defy him. Do not stay with them. Get in. He appeals to them. And still to this moment... We don't know what will happen. There's a, there's a kind of a beautiful drama in this passage. We don't know what will happen. I mean, think about it. Jesus taught a lot of people that were initially affected by his teaching, but then ultimately were looking to destroy him. So they felt bad of sorts. They were interested of sorts. And then Peter says, you have to repent and you have to believe. And we all know that experience where we kind of feel bad about something that we actually never do anything about. Have you ever had that experience? You feel bad about it, but it never actually changes anything. Oh, yeah, I feel, I feel terrible about that. And then you do it again next week. I mean, we, we've all had that experience, right? Well, that could have been this crowd. And so the drama of the passage builds until we get to verse 41. Here's the result. What God does in the hearts of these people, it says this. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. 3,000 souls. I mean, 3,000 people. I mean, try to imagine that. Jerusalem had somewhere between 50,000 and a couple hundred thousand people at this time. Imagine 3,000 people in a single day coming to faith in Jesus Christ. The percentage of the city even is overwhelming in a single day. that they, they see it and they believe it and they respond and they come to Jesus. I want the promise of the Holy Spirit. I want to believe that I can be forgiven from crucifying him. I, I want to accept Jesus as the Messiah. I will be baptized. I will stake my reputation, my future, my identity, all on what Peter says is true, and I will claim the name of Jesus. I now belong to him. Where's the next church meeting? Think about that. Think about the transformation for the church. I mean, these disciples, I mean, never was their church growth like this, okay? I mean, this little group of 120 people. All right, so look around. Like, I don't know, there's something 120-ish or something in here. I, here's our little church, and we believe in Jesus, and we're surrounded by people that hate him, okay? It's not nice, Christianized America. People that hate him all around us. We're this lonely group of people, 
and tomorrow there's 3,000 people, all of whom have confessed their sins, have believed in Jesus, and can't wait to learn more about what it means that God sent a Messiah to die on a cross. What a day that must have been! What a day. What does that mean? What does that mean for us? It means that the gospel is advancing with power in the hearts of those who will receive it. The gospel is advancing with power in the hearts of those who will receive it. I think that's the main point we're supposed to take away from, from this result of Peter's first sermon. This, this gospel about Jesus Christ, the news about him, there's no flashy drama display or anything. It's just talking about Jesus. It has the power to convert 3,000 people in a day. And not every day. I mean, probably good because Peter would have died early. But, but it it's, has that power. When God penetrates the heart, they see him, they see him there on that tree, they realize who he is, and they change and they respond and they want to join the church and become part of his fellowship. I mean, we need to be affected by the advance of the gospel, the gospel that is advancing with power in the hearts of those, you notice at the last phrase there, those who received the word. So no, it's not just universalism. If you hear the message, you'll, you'll ultimately be in heaven. If you know about Jesus, you'll ultimately be in heaven. No, there's, there's a receiving of the word. That's how the gospel works. It penetrates the heart. It breaks up the hard ground. And then fruit comes out of love towards Jesus and faith in him. I mean, try, let's just try to get into that moment and feel the power of it. Feel the power of the gospel, because I think we need to feel this if we're going to respond to it. Imagine Peter and the other apostles baptizing people late into the night, looking for fresh places in the river. Can we find a baptismal outside of the temple courts? Where, where can we go? And, and imagine the 120 working into the evening, explaining and teaching and praying, and probably tearful people saying, I can't believe I didn't see who he was. I can't believe it. And, and everybody now is now a lead. I don't care who you are. You're a leader in the church, okay? And you are now, you have groups of people, and you're leading them and praying for them about Jesus. And I want you to come over here. Go, go. There's five people over there, and they are weeping. You go encourage them and comfort them. Tell them their sins are forgiven. And this person wants to know how in the world it can be that Jesus could have been cursed by God. Well, let's take, take them and help them understand what it meant that Jesus died on the cross. And, and you go over there. We got eight more need to be baptized. Imagine what a night that was. What a week that was like. You're watching person after person with their heart broken by the truth about Jesus Christ and coming to that, that like Newton says, pleasing grief and mournful joy. This wonderful news. I, I've lived by him I killed. I now have access to God. Imagine a Jew who has traveled from Crete coming to the temple to see where God's presence is from a distance and suddenly realizing God has come upon them and they're experiencing the presence of God. What a day that was. What a gospel could bring it about. I want to ask three questions in application. Three questions. Because I want the gospel to advance in our hearts this morning. I want it to advance in my heart. I want it to advance in your heart. I want it to have this powerful effect in you and in me. Are we willing to let our heart be convicted by sin? Conviction is the necessary doorway to joy. Conviction is the necessary doorway to joy. You can't see Jesus in his glory as Savior unless you see yourself as someone who needed that salvation. And if I could just speak specifically to anybody here, young people, that is not a Christian. If you're here and you're an old person and you're not a Christian, can I just speak to you for a moment? You have to be willing to let God tell you the truth about what sin is. We all tend to think of ourselves as 
basically a nice, clean sheet of paper. And every once in a while, there's a little dot of inconvenient sin that pokes onto it. What God sees is the reality of a life lived in rejection of Him. A life lived ignoring Him. A life lived hating Him and cursing Him and giving Him no second thoughts. That's what God sees. So if you're here, and, and maybe you, you're here because your parents are here, and, and they believe in Jesus, and you know you're supposed to believe in Jesus, and you know the Bible stories about Jesus, but can I just tell you, you have to let your heart hear God tell you that in your heart there is disobedience towards God. There's sin towards God. And you have to let that pierce into your heart because it's true. God's not lying to you. It's true. And the good news is, if you let God tell you the truth about your sin, then he can tell you the truth about Jesus who died for your sin. Conviction is the necessary doorway to hope. Let me say this to Christians, too. This was the line this week for me that was most deeply affecting. I just began to ask myself the question, am I cut to the heart still by sin? Or is that a memory? Am I cut to the heart still by sin? A shallow view of my own sin will result in a shallow view of my Savior. The goal isn't that we would endlessly dig into the depths of our sin. The goal is that we would see the depths to which Jesus had to go to save us. So sin isn't the end, but it is a means. It is a means to that end. We're not going to understand the cross unless we understand sin. I was thinking this week about just, just a, one example. I, I, a few nights ago, I was sitting at dinner, and my daughter very sweetly made some kind of teasing comment about something that was awry with my shirt, and had been all day, <laughs> and something that was wrong. And, and in that moment, I just noticed an impatience. I don't have to... You know, it wasn't, it didn't explode out of me. It wasn't, you know, no verbal, you know, just kind of a little look at my wife, a slight indignation. So then Lori brought it up to me later. She said, it seemed like you were bothered by what she said. It seemed like maybe that was pride. Now, how do I think about that moment? How would you counsel me if you were sitting down with me at that moment? Here's everything in my soul and what it wants to say. Don't do it, but no big deal. Like 99% of my natural reaction to realizing that I did that was, don't do it, but no big deal. I didn't shout at her. I didn't belittle her. I didn't storm. I wasn't ruined for the rest of the night. I wasn't grumpy all night long. It was, don't do it, but no big deal. I mean, that's everything in my mind tells me that's how I should think about that. And I thought about what God sees. And I realized we see what breaks the surface. God sees what's underneath. For pride to break the surface against a sweet little ten-year-old girl who's offering almost no temptation in that moment, it must be the case that pride exists underneath the surface all day long. It must be that all day long I was finding some level of comfort in my appearance and that I don't think I deserve to have little children tell me how I could look better. It must be that all day long I was assuming a high view of how I looked that day. And God was watching that all day long. 
It must be that I despise having critique from someone who's younger than me. And I don't think I deserve that kind of critique. And I deserve respect. And I deserve to be honored. And I deserve to be appreciated. And I shouldn't have to be talked to that way. It must be that all day long, that was existing in my soul. And you know who saw it? Not me, but God. And he watched all day long while hidden pride existed. <laughs> taking comfort in how I thought about myself. So he sent a sweet little girl to just say, Daddy, there's something wrong with your shirt. And what comes out of me? Not, oh, you're right, honey, that's so silly. You know what comes out of me? <sighs> Seriously? You know what God says? If you can be tempted by a little girl commenting on your shirt, what would you think if everyone started commenting on your sins? What would you think if people didn't honor and respect you all the time? What would you think then? How much of your heart is consumed with yourself if you trip over the temptation of a sweet little girl? A lot. I began to think, that's just one moment. <laughs> what about the moment of impatience with the driver the other day? Or what about the moment when there was a look of lust the other day? Or what about the moment I was self-righteous towards my wife the other day? Or what about the moment when I was undisciplined with my time the other day? Or what about the moment I was lazy the other day? And I begin to see what God sees. Under this nice surface. There's all these godless moments. And I realized all those godless moments had to go somewhere. They can't be taken to heaven. They had to go somewhere. I don't want impatient people like me in heaven. <laughs> so where do they go? God won't take them into heaven. God's never like that. Where do they go? Where do those thousands of impatient, self-righteous, arrogant, lustful, selfish moments go? Where do they go? Well, the Bible gives us the answer. They, all of them, went on Jesus. They, all of them, nailed him to that cross. Every single one of those moments put him there, and he received God's perspective about them and not mine. And when they put him there... They put him there so that I wouldn't have to stand up before God and be told a million moments that I dismissed that were actually atrocious in heaven. So that when I go to heaven, God says, He paid it all. Are we willing to let our hearts be convicted by sin. Conviction is the doorway to hope. Second question, are we willing to receive the call of the gospel this morning? Are we willing to receive it this morning? If, if you're not a Christian, listen to what Peter says to you. Peter says to you, that this is a trustworthy man, he says to you this morning, if you're not a Christian, repent and believe in Jesus. Be baptized. That just means to, to declare publicly, and baptism is a ritual where you go under the water. It's just a public way of saying, look, I, I believe in Jesus Christ. He's my Savior. I trust in Him. I don't trust in myself anymore. Are you willing to respond to the call of the gospel? And if you're a Christian here this morning, let's consider this. Are you willing to hear in a fresh way the call of the gospel? To remember again that you believe in Jesus, that Jesus is your Savior. To remember again that your sins are forgiven on account of the name. How many times this week have you spent thinking about your sins? And how many times this week have you thought about his forgiveness? I'd be willing to bet it's not an equal list. We're vaguely aware of our sins, and we're only occasionally aware of his forgiveness, or we're topically aware of his forgiveness. I think sometimes we think of his forgiveness the way we think about life insurance. Maybe every month or so, or every six months or so, we, we remember, okay, am I, yeah, I think I'm good, all the payments being made, we're good. It's there, 
But it's not fresh. It's not in front of us. It's not affecting us. It's not gripping us. And my prayer this morning is that the gospel would advance in our hearts the way it advanced on that day. Is the gospel advancing in your heart such that you're receiving the call of the gospel again? Receive the forgiveness of God through Jesus Christ again. Receive it. I'm talking to you, Christian. I know you were saved 20 years ago, but I want to ask you right now, are you aware of the forgiveness that God offers through Jesus Christ? Right now, this morning, are you aware that God offers complete and total and categorical forgiveness for everything you've done? There is nothing you have done that is worse than what they did. And he says the promise is for you. And he says this morning, you can be forgiven of your sin this week. Neglecting the joy of forgiveness is devastating to every Christian. Are you enjoying forgiveness this morning? I think that's the call of the gospel. Look, this gospel is advancing. It advances to 3,000 people that day, and it can advance to your heart this morning. The Holy Spirit has been given to you. Are you aware of that this week? This week, the Holy Spirit given to you in spite of the difficulty in your family, in spite of the temptation of this boss at work, in spite of the way that you're treated by various people in your life, are you aware that God has given himself to you because of what Jesus did on the cross? Is that transforming the way you think about your parenting and your marriage and your work and your evangelism? Is it transforming that thinking? If not, let's let the gospel advance into our heart again. Let's let the truth that we've been given forgiveness and the presence of God, let's let it advance. This is our identity. This is our identity. This is much more important to us than we have a yard to mow tomorrow and we've got to work out this vacation plan and we've got to figure out this bill that has to be paid and did I ever get that thing done back to my accountant and did I, did I figure out what's going on with my neighbor and what about this problem with the car? Th- this is more important than any of that. You have been given forgiveness in Jesus' name and the presence of God is with you. That identity is more important than anything else in your life. Let the gospel advance into your heart again. Final question. Are you willing to be transformed by the advancing gospel? Everything about these people's life was about to change. Everything. I had to be baptized in the name of Jesus when the Sanhedrin itself had crucified him was life-altering. This gospel's worth being transformed. Let's ask ourselves, is our life defined by the advancing gospel? Is it defined by it? Does it give us joy when other things are taken away? Does it give us boldness with a neighbor that we know needs a relationship with a Christian so they can hear about the gospel? Does the power of this gospel motivate us towards our parents or our children or our cousin or our co-worker when they need to hear about the gospel? Does it motivate us when we think about what we're going to do first thing in the morning or we're going to do last thing at night? Does it motivate us when we're feeling discouraged? Does the power of the gospel come into our minds when we're feeling discouraged this week when we have a conflict with our spouse? Does does the power of the gospel come to mind? Let's let it come to mind. Let's let our, our... our conflict this week be transformed by the power of the gospel and our, our communication be transformed by the power of the gospel. Let, let's let our conversations with our children be affected by the power of the gospel. It saved 3,000 people in a day. It can save you when you're facing that tempting moment with your child this week. Now, many of us do not need to be converted but we need to be freshly overwhelmed by the advancing gospel again. Let's not just say we're gospel-centered. Let's think about this good news this week. Let's think about it. Think about it tomorrow. Think about it on your way to work. Find a way to put the gospel facts right in front of you and meditate on them until you marvel and marvel at them until you worship. The gospel is advancing with power in the hearts of those who will receive it. John Newton, who wrote that hymn, 
many, many years later, said this. I think he said it because he kept the advancing gospel advancing in his own heart. I think that's why he said it. Because it never got old. It never stalled. He made sure it kept moving forward with fresh affections and fresh joy and fresh confidence and fresh piercings of conviction and fresh receiving of hope and assurance. I think he let it keep pressing forward until he was old. And because of that, when he was old, he said this, Although my memories fading, I remember two things very clearly. I am a great sinner, and Christ is a great Savior. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for dying for our sins, giving us forgiveness. Oh, Lord, it's so good to be forgiven. It's so good to know that we, we're not going to be punished for our sins. Oh, we're not even aware of how serious they are, Lord. And to face punishment for them, Lord, would be devastating eternally. And yet you have created forgiveness. We thank you for that, Lord. And I pray for anyone here that has been doubting your forgiveness. Lord, I, I pray that you would re-speak that beautiful phrase from Peter into their hearts. The promise is for you. Lord, please make eye contact with them right now. Lord, please do that. Lord, I just ask you. The promise is for you. forgiveness of your sins, that sin, the assurance that God will dwell with us. But as a church, we renounce self-righteousness, self-confidence. We renounce the lie of doubt. We renounce hardness of heart and the minimizing of sin. And we renounce fear of your judgment. And we stand on Christ alone. Lord, advance this gospel in our hearts and through us to others. Advance it, Lord. Energize it. Show us the power of it, Lord. Give us again pleasing grief and mournful joy. Fill our spirits with love for Christ and Him crucified. Father, do all this in the name of Your Son, by the power of Your Spirit. We pray. Amen.